Good morning. It's a beautiful Lord's Day to be able to be with one another, to be able to gather. Traveling and out of town for the holiday weekend, but we're so this morning. If you would open up to Psalm 145, Psalm 145, we will find our text for the lesson this hour. Psalm 145, beginning in verse 1, we read, I will extol you. O my, or I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Our generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, and, and on your wondrous works, men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness, and shall sing your righteousness. Psalm that definitely points to the fact and helps us to realize how great God is, and the fact that God is great. And we recognize that God is great, and as a result of his works and his acts, his majesty, his goodness, that we are to declare and to teach those to each generation. Not only are we to declare and to teach those to each generation, but they are to be meditated upon. The fact that God is so awesome, the fact that God is so great. And as verse 3 puts it at the very end, his greatness is unsearchable. God is so awesome and so great. His greatness is to the point that we really can't comprehend how great he is. The psalm doesn't stop there. It goes on to explain why this is. We recognize in verses 8 through 9 throughout the psalm that God is gracious and merciful to all. And that is no doubt true. Whenever we understand and we recognize our state and where we were uh, being in sin, separated from God but yet he has given us that opportunity to come back to him. Those who became enemies of God, yet he gives an opportunity to be his friends, to be his friend, to be his children. God is gracious and merciful, and he does this, and it's available to all. In 14 through 16, we understand and recognize that God provides what is needed for his creation. And he does this not as a result of anything that we have done, but the fact that God loves us and cares for us so much. In 17 through 20, we recognize that God is near those who call upon him in truth, that he preserves and saves those who love and fear him, that he will also destroy the wicked. The fact that God is righteous, the fact that God is fair, that he is just in his actions and in his very being who he is. Yes, God is great, and we recognize that, and we go back, and that is the reason why we are to declare and to teach God. We are to teach him to the generation we are in for sure, but it goes on to talk about the fact that we are to declare and to teach generation to generation. This isn't something that's just for one generation and to be kept there, but to be taught to our children and to our children's children. We're to declare God's works and acts, his majesty, his goodness. How awesome and how great he is. And not only are we to declare it, but then whatever that is declared, who God is, and is talked about how awesome he is, that is to be meditated upon. That is something that, 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 that is to be taught and to be thought about constantly. It's not just a message just declared and you, and you put it in your mind and you think, yeah, that's, that's, that's good, that, that, that's helpful, but then you go out your day and you don't even think about it. You're to meditate on how great and how awesome and how, uh, and who God is. Well, what I want to do with this morning is understand and recognize that there is something else that we are to do. We are to remember. 
the works of God. We are to remember the acts of God. We're to remember the majesty and the goodness of God and the fact that God is great. And I've titled this lesson this morning from Psalm 147, Precious Memories. We are to remember these things. We are to have these memories of who God is and what he has done, what he has done throughout time, what he has done from the beginning in creating the world, creating man, being mindful of man, as Psalm 8 talks about. And whenever man has sinned and separated himself from God, the fact that he gives us that opportunity to come back to him, but that throughout time and throughout The word of God, we recognize the the promises of God and how true they are. We recognize how faithful God is. We recognize who God is. These memories are to be there. They're to be something that we go back to and that we think about often. You know, the thing about these memories that we have, and whenever I'm talking about that, I'm talking about that idea of calling to remembrance. That's really the idea we get there in verse 7 of this psalm says, they shall utter the memory of your great goodness, shall sing of your righteousness. The memory, the remembrance of how good God is and who God is. Like I said, the psalm goes on to explain who God is and what he's done and why he is is worthy of not only being praised, but why we need to remember him. You know, the thing about bringing things to remembrance or memories, these precious memories of who God is, you think about him, in your own life and what memories help you to do. Memories help you to focus. They turn our mind back to something else when we are in the middle of a situation. But you think about that. It could be the fact that we are, we've had this personal experience. And as a result of that personal experience, we are in a situation and something happened, a decision that we made or an action that we took and, and there was an outcome. And then down the line, we're in a similar situation. What do we often do? Well, I remember whenever I did this, whenever I made that choice or that decision, I don't want to do that again because this was the outcome. Or I do want to do that again because this was an outcome and it was positive. So memories can come from that personal experience. But whenever I think about this, what I think about is something someone said to me. Calling to remembrance whenever I'm in the middle of a situation, what was said to me to help me get through a given situation. You know, maybe it's uh, being one who um, has uh, a good relationship with my dad and my grandpas or, or, or some of those men. But I remember conversations that we've had. Uh, you, you think about, at least for me, I remember fishing and being out in the water with dad, and it was just dead still. There is no wind blowing, there's no nothing. We're out on the boat, it's hot, and nothing is biting. And then all of a sudden we come around the corner because we've been back in a cove and a wind is blowing on a main lake channel, on a main lake point. And dad stops and says, we're going to hit this point because there are going to be active fish. And wouldn't you know, we start catching fish left and right. That wind starts blowing in and it gets the fish active. And so I remember that it was only uh, two or three years ago I was out on the water with my cousin. We were fishing, similar situation, dead calm. And we're not catching a thing. And we're wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to go catch these fish? And I remembered that moment. And I remember Dad talking about the fact, if it's calm, try to find a windy point, And the fish are going to be active. And when you know, we go around to the windy point, and the fish are crazy active. We start catching fish. But like I said, it might not just be words, because I also remember this. If you ever fish with a bait caster and you try to cast into the wind, it's not good. You're going to get backlash and you're going to be done fishing. And I did that before. And so I remembered from personal experience to not only go to the windy point, but then put the boat in the proper position where I'm casting with the wind so I can fish the whole time. The point that I'm trying to bring up is this. These memories help us in a given situation. Remembering maybe a conversation that we had or a point that was made. I remember hunting. And Jade's dad telling me, don't go walking into the woods. It's going to blow your scent right where the deer are going to be coming from because you're going to blow them out and they won't come out. And that stays with me any time that I enter the woods. I check the wind. I think about the wind. I think about these things. I remember Jade's grandpa used to always say, remember who you are. What he was saying that what he meant is remember that you are a Christian. 
Remember who you are. And so in any moment, in any situation that you come into, you remember those words and, and, and they come to the forefront of your mind and remind you of what you need to do in this given situation and what you should be doing and how to get through it. And it's in that sense that I want to talk about and look at this lesson of precious memories. And not memories from something that some man said, but memories and bringing to remembrance, recalling the word of God and what God says to help you get through various situations that we come into in this life. Remember that God is awesome, that God is good, that God is great, his works prove who he is, his majesty. We, we can't even fathom it. It's unsearchable. But to bring these to remembrance of how good, and how good and how awesome God is when we are in various moments in our life. You think about whenever you come across various temptation in this life. And no doubt temptation is something that's going to be there. We read in James chapter 1, 13 through 15. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor he himself be tempted by anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and entice. Temptation occurs. No doubt Satan is behind this. We back up in verse 13, and that's one of the things that's pointed out. It's not God that's doing this or that's bringing it about. God's not going to be the one that, 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 that's trying to tempt you. No, no doubt who's behind this, but it is going to happen to all of us. And we need to be cautious and weary of the fact that we're not ones that are drawn by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Because in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, we read the fact that that's not of the Father, but it's of the world. So we don't want to be given in to this temptation and being drawn away by our desires, by our lust. Things such as sexual immorality or drunkenness. We don't want to be drawn to those things. Immodesty, as we talked about recently in the lesson, understanding that there is a proper way and an improper way to dress. We don't want to be drawn away to, to, to dress in a manner that, that, that is improper. Covetousness, that idea of more to have, materialism. We don't want to be drawn away from that. We don't want, we don't, we don't want our minds to, to be distracted by the things of this world and seeking after those things. Pride of life and that self-boasting, trying to elevate self. These things come about in our life. Everyone faces them every day, especially young people. You face these types of things. You face the immorality of this life and of this world. You face this, the, 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 this, this uh, opportunity that Satan might be trying to take to, to cause you to boast in yourself. The idea of materialism and looking out and seeing what someone uh, else has. And, 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 and uh, well, I want more as well. I need more. More to have. I don't have enough. These things tempt us and what they are uh, designed to do is to draw us away from God. But what we need to do is we need to in those moments whenever temptation is strong. Whenever... Our desires are pulling us down that path. What we need to do is call to remembrance God's word and God's message and who God is. What's going to keep me from going down this path? What's going to keep me from going down this path is calling to remembrance who God is. So we see in Psalm 145, verse 20, the Lord preserves all who love him. The Lord does preserve all who love him, but call to remembrance that God will destroy the wicked. We not only see that there, but we see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Recognize that. These that are listed are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But you know what's going to happen when you're in the world? When you're in the world is you're going to have those that are going to be drawing, uh, trying to draw you away from that idea. It doesn't matter. It's okay. If you're one that's drunk or you participate in fornication, sex outside of marriage, it's all good. It's not a problem. 
you're tempted, and, and I mean, you're, you're too weak to be able to handle that anyways, and, and God's not going to keep you out of heaven. You need to call to remembrance who God is and that God does love us and he is gracious and he is merciful. And we're going to get into that more here in a bit. But the fact that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. God is just. We recognize that. He will destroy the wicked. So we need to call that to remembrance. But I want to tell you something else we need to call to remembrance. We recognize and realize that God is going to destroy those who practice these things. That those who practice these things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But so oftentimes what happens is, is, is we get in our mind, I can't do this. I can't get through it. It's just the temptation and desire. It's just way too strong. I, can't, I just can't do it. We also need to keep in mind the fact that God is faithful and that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. See, th th this is the problem that so many go down the path is they go down this path of thinking that the desire is too strong and I can't withstand Satan and his temptations. I can't stand against him. I, I, I just, I, I'm just going to have to give in. And the world, no doubt, feeds you that concept or that thought. But you always need to keep in mind this. One, that God's going to destroy those who are wicked and who practice these things. But God's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you are not able to withstand. That's where a lot of people fail. It's from the beginning they think that I just am not strong enough and I cannot do it. But keep in mind that God is faithful and he's not going to put something in front of you that you are unable to handle. So what's our conclusion? You are strong enough and you can handle it. That you're only going to do it if you lean upon God, because God is the one that is faithful. God is going to help you through it. And you've got to call these things to remembrance, because when you're in that moment, you feel like the, the temptation is so strong, you can't hold or keep from doing it. But understand that you can, that there is a way, and how you can is by leaning upon God. Going to his word and making that application to your life. And in doing so, you can live properly. You can avoid and, and, and not give in to that temptation. We need to understand that and we need to recognize that. Whenever we're going through temptation, bring up these memories, if you will. From God's word, what he says, and we know that they are true, that we can stand on them. As a result of that, we can make it through whatever temptation, whatever situation that we are in. Not only that, I want you to think about adversity and trial that we might go through. An adversity or trial that we might go through where we need to recall these memories and remember who God is. First, I want to look at just an adversity or trial that's by time and chance, meaning just life. As the ecclesiastical writer says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 10 through 11, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work nor, or, or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. I, return, I returned and uh, saw under the sun that the race is not swift nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to men, under, uh, to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are in this life. It doesn't matter if you're at the top of society or at the very bottom of society. It doesn't matter if you're the most secularly educated individual or you've never had an ounce of secular education in your life. It doesn't matter what country you're from. Time and chance happen to all of us. Life happens. Things such as the loss of a loved one, an unexpected injury or illness, unexpected financial hardships. These things come upon all. These types of things come about. Life happens. And it really doesn't matter who you are this isn't something that you necessarily brought upon yourself. You're just living through this life. Something happens. 
Time and chance happen to us all. Whenever you go through it, there's so many times where, 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 where we get beaten down and, and we're so discouraged from it. And many even questions start to ask, is there a God? They might not go down that path, but then they no doubt in the back of their mind start asking, well, why would God even allow this in the first place? I mean, I thought God loved me and I thought God cared about me. Why, why is he doing this? Whenever these unexpected things happen to us in our life, these are the thoughts that come to mind. And this is just time and chance that it doesn't matter if you're living right for God or if you're not, these things happen. So what do we need to do when we're going through one of these types of situations? What we need to do is we need to call to remembrance who God is. Psalm 147, verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. God provides comfort for those who need it and seek him. This verse right here is one that uh, was given to me at a point in time whenever I desperately needed it. It was one of those situations where you're just going through life and some different things start coming out, some news starts coming out, or, or, or you know, so, some things happen, and it was just a discouraging time. And one of our close friends wrote this on a note and gave us cookies along with it. But wrote this on a sticky note, and it was sitting at our house whenever we got home. And you don't have any idea how much this helped during that time. And it wasn't because they wrote a scripture. Yes, we were so thankful to them. But they brought to remembrance the word of God. And the fact that God cares about us. God provides comfort for those who need it. For those who seek him. God is great and God is awesome. And let us never forget that whenever we go through a moment or a time in our life. Whenever we start wondering why is this happening. Why are we going through this? We, we're, we're, living, we're trying to live for God. We're doing everything we can to live by his word. Understand that time and chance that life happens. But also remember, as Harry pointed out this morning, that God cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Talks about that. We are to be those who humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and cast all of our cares upon him. Why? Simply put, God cares for you. Don't you ever think that God doesn't care for you, that God's just hanging you out to dry, that God is just allowing you to go through this and could care less about, about you. God cares for you. And in the same light, what we understand is he provides that opportunity and that avenue to come to him. And to cast our cares and concerns upon him and leave it in his hands, understanding that God cares for us. We need to recognize this, brethren. Time and chance, life happens. Family members might do things and make choices that we don't understand. Things might just happen and we start wondering, why, why is this? How do I keep on? How, 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 do I, how do I get through this? Recall the remembrance of God's word and the fact that he cares for you. Think about what he has done for you in your life to this point. And if nothing else, he has provided you with that opportunity to be right with him whenever we were his enemies. God cares for you. So turn to him. Whenever you are in the midst of adversity, trial, in a time or chance moment whenever life just happens. But you know, it's not just adversity and trial happens just by time and chance. Whenever you're just living life and you have the loss of a loved one or things happen. But also living as a Christian, you're going to go through adversity and trial. This is something that we talked about going through the letter that we read of, in First Peter. Out here in the auditorium and back in the high school class. That living as a Christian, whenever you live for God, whenever you live for Christ, that adversity and trial, that it's going to come about. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 
In this you greatly rejoice, after he's been talking about the hope that we have, we greatly rejoice in that hope. Why? Because for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. You're going to go through trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory. The revelation of Jesus Christ living for God, standing for his truth, as we talked about doing in Jude, contending for that faith. That doesn't mean that it's going to be sunshine and rainbows. It's not going to be all good from that standpoint. Contending implies that there is a fight that's going to have to be had. And standing for truth. Jesus was not, uh, did not keep that a secret in his life. He did not keep that a secret in his life. And he did not keep that a secret from his apostles and, and, and disciples and future disciples. That whenever you live for him, whenever you follow him, you need to count the cost because there's a cost of discipleship. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be adversity and trials as a result of living for him and standing for truth. He says in Luke chapter 14, verse 20, uh, sorry, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and first count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another, does not sit down first to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still great uh, way off, he sends it. Uh, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. There is a cost to discipleship, and what that is is we have to be those who completely forego our will and what we have, and be willing to live for God. And so, as we live for Him, we recognize that things are going to happen. You might lose relationships in this life. That's one of the things that Jesus talks about. You can't put father or mother, brother or sister before me. You have to put me first. Put me above all in this world. I am first. And your relationship with me is more important than that relationship with those individuals. And if you stand for truth, if you truly follow me, you're going to be hated. Jesus talks about that as well. As a result of that, you can lose relationships. You can also suffer and go through persecution. And it might not be at the same level as those in the first century, at least at this point, where our life's endangered. It could be. No doubt being those who face and go through people who ridicule you, call you names, who are just mean to you. Maybe lose a job or your kids can't get on a sports or activity team because you're not willing to do the things and be gone from services or participate in the ways and activities that those on those teams are asking them to do. No doubt we suffer persecution. So how do I keep my mind? How, how, how do I keep living like I should? How do I keep on when this is the case? Whenever I'm living for God, because see, that's what happens so often. The mindset becomes, if I live for God, it's all going to be great, and so there's not going to be any problems. The opposite is actually the case. Whenever you live for God, what you are doing is you are living in such a way that is against the world, but you live in the world. So you're going to have those who don't appreciate you. Yeah, that's the thing. You think about the fact that you're living for God. You're living as Christ was. You're, you're being the example that he was. How can he be hated? Jesus was hated. Jesus was hated. How are his disciples going to be above the teacher or the master? Jesus says that isn't the case. So how do I keep on whenever this is the case, whenever I know that this is going to happen, whenever it does start happening? Well, understand, as we said, that the world hated Jesus. As he said, his disciples will be hated as well. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. Yeah, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, 
Understand that? Remember. Call to remembrance this whenever you're in this moment. The word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. When you're in that moment, what do you need to do? What did Jesus say to do? Remember these words that I'm about to tell you. Call to remembrance, call to your mind these things. And what is it? What that is, is the servant isn't greater than his master. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Hey, if they, if they kept my word, then they will accept you. When we're living in this world, this is going to happen. And so we need to call that to remembrance. We need to understand that, that, that this is the case. But we also need to understand something else. Because it's going to be really hard to continue, to continue on in spite of the words of Jesus saying, hey, this is how it's going to be. You need to remember that this is how it's going to be. So don't be surprised when it does happen. Whenever it does happen, understand that God will not leave or forsake you. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to take you out of the situation. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. He doesn't, that doesn't mean that he's going to take you out of the trial. He didn't, he's not going to take you away from that moment every single time. But what it means is this, that God is with you. And he will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. That's what he told Joshua before Joshua led the children of Israel into the Canaan land. And along with that, we understand and recognize what that entailed and what that means. What, or what, what that meant, that Joshua was also to be one who meditated upon God's word, that kept his word. We need to understand that God will not leave us nor forsake us. And I know in that moment and in that time, it feels like he, he has. I mean, I'm living for him and I'm doing his word. What do you mean he will not leave me and forsake me? I mean, look, look at what I'm going through. I got all these friends that I used to have and none of them talk to me anymore. I got all these people out here who hate me because I'm standing for truth, because I'm telling them exactly what Scripture says. How do I keep on? Well, God's not going to leave you forsaken. Well, it seems like he has. Remember Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. Whenever Daniel's living for God, and he works his way up. And he's there, and it would almost appear that, that uh, God completely abandoned him whenever a law was put into place that said he can no longer pray to his God for 30 days. But Daniel knew that God was with him. And it wasn't about that he completely, 100% knew God was going to save him, but he knew, I'm going to keep doing the will of God as I have done throughout my life. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to continue to pray as I always have. And I'm going to let the chips fall where they fall. Why? Because I know God is with me and he's not going to forsake me. My life might be lost. Same thing happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our life might be lost, but know that our God is able to save us if that is his will. And that's what we need to keep in mind. I want you to read whenever you have time Psalm 55, where the psalmist is, the psalmist is talking about the fact that he has been betrayed by those who were closest to him. And how much that hurts. But yet, he reminds himself throughout that psalm of who God is and the fact that he's going to remain faithful to him. It's Psalm 55. That would be good for us to do. When you're in a moment and, you're feet, and, and, and you think, God has left me, but not only that, you just... Everyone's abandoning me, and, and, and this is too hard to do to keep on keeping on. Remember who God is. That's what the psalmist did. It's something we're to do. But you know, we also need to keep in mind the end goal. God will never leave you nor forsake you, but when you're in that moment and you're living for God, what is going to keep me keeping on, if you will? What's going to keep me keeping on is keeping my eyes on the prize having the proper perspective of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the goal, this is Paul writing, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And has been said many times before, Paul is in prison when he is writing this letter. How did he continue to keep on? How did he continue to live for God? He was in prison because he was standing for truth. How did he continue to keep on living for that truth whenever he was thrown in prison for standing for truth? 
because his eyes were set on the prize of heaven. Whenever you're going through that adversity or that trial as a result of living as a Christian, doing the will of God, keep your mind in heaven. And that's what we talked about in 1 Peter. That's where he starts off his letter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter is writing a letter to those who are going through persecution and suffering, adversity for living for God, and he starts off the letter reminding them of the hope that they have, and that is why you are standing for the truth that you are standing for. You have a hope, a reward in heaven in doing so. So how do I get through it? How do I get through this time whenever I'm going through adversity? How you do it is you remember who God is. You bring up the to remembrance, you bring up in your memory the words of God and what he says, that there is a hope in the end for those who stand for truth fact that he is going to be with you. The examples that we see throughout the Old Testament proving that that is the case. Lastly, what I want to conclude with is what about whenever you're separated from God? We need to remember God's word whenever we are going through temptation and whenever we're going through adversity and trial so that we hopefully don't fall. We hopefully don't sin and separate ourselves from God. But what if we do? And what if we get so caught up in sin in this life? Is there anything that we can remember then? You bet there is. Some get to a place, though, where they, they, they do not come back to God. There's multiple reasons why this might be, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but some of the things you might hear is they think sin is not a big deal. It's not a big deal, the fact that I've sinned, and I know that the sin is bad, and it might have separated me from God, but it's, it's, it's all good. Others might just be too embarrassed or prideful to confess and repent sin, repent of sin. And as a result of that, they, they don't come back to God. Others might get to a point where they don't think that God will ever forgive them for what they have done. So what about when we're in these situations? How, how do I call to remembrance the things that God has said to help me get through that? We need to call something to remembrance. If one thinks that there's this, uh, that this sin isn't that big of a deal, they need to call to remembrance the seriousness of sin. The fact that it is a big deal. That we are not to be too prideful. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 talks about the fact that our sins and our iniquity separated us from God. And Romans 6, 23 talks about the fact that the wages of sin is death. There is a seriousness to sin. We need to understand that. We need to turn and repent of those things and come back to God, but we need to call to mind and to remembrance how serious sin is. Not only that, we need to remember the love and mercy and grace of God and how awesome God is. Some people get to that point to where they think that God will not forgive me of that sin. God will forgive you if you're willing to repent of those things. He is willing to forgive you, and he wants you to. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. We read that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he moved our transgressions. Recognize that. God will remove our transgressions, and he will remember them no more. There are those that think that I, I have, what I have done in my life, God is not going to be able to forgive me of that. It's just too bad. I'm, I've, I've gone down this path and I'm too far away. I'm too far gone. If you are willing to 
return to God. If you are willing to repent of those things and be obedient to him. As the psalmist goes on, he says in verse 13, as a father pities his his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. If you are one that fears him and that humbles yourself and, and turns back to him, repents from that thing that you are doing, that transgression will be remembered no more. And as he said, as far as the east is from the west, we can't even comprehend. It's, it's no longer going to be held to our account if we are those who turn to God. This is the love and mercy and grace of God. And the fact that he's given us today is proof of that love and mercy and grace. Second Peter 3 verse 9 talks about the fact that the long suffering of the Lord. Don't consider that slackness. The fact that he wants all to come to repentance. That's what God wants. So don't think for a second whenever you are caught up in sin, if you are there and you are caught up and you are living a life of sin, that you can't come back to God. If you are willing to humble yourself and submit to him and to be obedient to him and repent and turn of those things, confessing that sin, he will forgive you. Think of parable of the prodigal son the fact that he is one that went off and that blew his inheritance and was at a point where he was a low man on the totem pole if you will in society and that he turned and understood you know why am i here doing this whenever i can at least go back to my father Whenever I can go back to my earthly father and he's going to give me uh, at least a job. Why, why, why am I still doing this? And so we turned and he went back and we see the love that the father had for his son. The one that was lost, that was gone, that blew everything and, and that lived the life that he did but returned to him. You can be one that is dead in sin. But you have the opportunity to be made alive again, to come back to God and to humble yourself, to acknowledge error, to acknowledge the fact that you were wrong and that you, were, that, that, that you have sinned and turn away from that and start living for him. When you are in that moment, don't think for a moment that God will not forgive you of something that you do not repent of. But also keep in mind that we must repent of that. You think of Acts chapter 8 and Simon the sorcerer. Yes, he had been baptized and he had sinned, but what, did, what, what, did, uh, what was he told that he had to do? Repent, therefore, of this great wickedness. If you are willing to repent of that, then God will forgive you of that. And you need to call that to remembrance and not continue to live that life of sin, but to turn from that and come back to God. And so we bring all this together. And I want to make just one quick application of this that we see from the get-go. Because the whole idea of what we talked about is this. You need to call these things to remembrance. You need to remind yourself of these things when you're in those moments. But I want you to think about something that the psalmist did there in 4 through 7. He started off talking about the works and the majesty and the goodness of God and the fact that they are to be taught. And not only are they to be taught, but that they are then to then be meditated upon. And whenever they are taught and meditated upon, that's whenever that, those memories are going to be there in the back of your mind and going to be recalled. If one does not hear and meditate on the word of God, the memories aren't going to be there. I remember that moment whenever I was fishing with dad. And I remember after we got dealt off the water that day and all the fish that we caught, and we continued to talk about it afterwards, and it was always in the back of my mind. So whenever I was in that moment, I recalled to remembrance what I needed to do, go catch fish that day. You are going to be able to call to remembrance these things that we have in God's word, these precious memories that we have when? Whenever you hear God's word, when you meditate upon them. You need to be in God's word and studying. So when you're in that moment, you're going to recall these words and that message. You need to meditate on it. You don't just need to read it and then not ever think about it, but think about it and meditate upon it. And one other piece of application that can come from that is this. Parents, you need to start teaching your children right now the word of God so that whenever they are in those moments in middle school and high school, 
in college and they're off on their own, what comes to their mind is the words of God and how to handle and how to get through the various situations that they are in. These memories that we have that come from God's word are vital. There's something that help guide us through the situations or the, 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 the different situations and things that we go through in this life. But in order to recall those, we need to be those who have them in our mind. We need to study God's word and we need to meditate upon them. Like we said, one of the things that we can bring to mind and recall to mind is the fact that God is loving that he is merciful, that his, grace, that, that, that his grace is sufficient, and that he wants you to be right with him. He wants you to come to repentance, to be obedient to his message. Have you done that? Have you been baptized into Christ, being obedient to the message that we see, the gospel message in Mark 16, 15, and 16, and we see preach in Acts 2, 38? If you have not, you can come forward this morning making your life right with God. But if you have and you've, you, you, you've fallen away, you've wandered away, call to memory, remember the message and the word of God and the fact that we have today that he has given you that opportunity to make your life right. If you have any need, do not delay another second. Come forward as we stand and sing the song. It's been selected. <laughs>